All right. Good morning and thanks for joining us for the PNAMP Fish Monitoring Workgroup Meeting. Uh, a couple housekeeping tips before we get started. Please mute yourself by clicking the little microphone on your Teams platform. Um, also, please turn off your camera if you're not speaking. It's kind of distracting. If you don't see the toolbar, uh, try wiggling your mouse a little and it should pop up on the top or bottom of your screen. Um, you should see something that's kind of like what's on Jen's screen. Um, if I'm thinking you're forwarding, Jen, I can't see your slides right now. Yeah, just go one more forward. There we go. Perfect. Uh, let's see. If you're on the phone, please use star six to mute yourself. Uh, next slide, Jen. If you have questions or feedback, please use the chat function or raise your hand and unmute yourself. Um, you need to manually unmute yourself. We can't do it. Um, we are recording the meeting and it will be available on our YouTube channel next week. Um, now, if you could open up the chat and introduce yourself with name and organization, that helps us keep track of participation. Next slide, Jen. Perfect. <clears throat> Uh, on the agenda, we'll start off with the testing updates and then transition to a presentation from Edom, uh, sorry, Ian T Tatum, uh, the John Day Research Project Leader for ODFNW, and conclude with wrap up and next steps. Uh, next slide, Jen. Uh, today's topics are going to include uh, the CAP DES juvenile out migrant refinement to find small equivalent task that we wrapped up in December. Uh, fish population names and GIS boundaries, carrying capacity data standard, uh, juvenile density data standards, uh, snorkel and electrofishing, rotary screw trap data collection and data standards. And, oops, sorry, Nancy, yours dropped off. It's the um, MAFAC uh, StreamNet task. Um, I don't have the name in front of me right now. Uh, MAFAC and MPCC SPI. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nancy to kick this uh, task updates off. Here I am. <laughs> Too many buttons to click. Uh, that's an interesting setup. Okay. So this one is going to be a, a quick one. Uh, we started earlier on work to get input from the fish monitoring work group task group folks that were interested in this topic to help further uh, refine and confirm how we are defining uh, smelt equivalent in our data exchange standard that we're currently using in the um, Corn Assessment Partnership Fish HLIs. So Mike Manick and Russell Cranton were the co-leads on that. Um, they did a lot of prep work ahead of time, uh, had the product ready to be shared with the task group, which they did, and received some further input um, that then led to uh, firming up the recommendation that have come back to StreamNet. And we are currently planning on sharing those recommendations with the StreamNet technical team in February. And I would probably wrap up this first part of um, work related to the CAP DES. And we plan to come back to this work group when additional issues pop up that we want to get broader input on. Next slide, <clears throat> unless there's questions on this one. And I know Mike is here, so if people have questions, uh, he can also help address them. Thinking there are no questions. Okay. Uh, the next one is also related to uh, StreamNet and our broader GIS center here at uh, Pacific States Marine Fishery Commission. Uh, the co-leads for this one are Van Hare, which is um, the individual leading our GIS center at Pacific State and helps develop all the maps that we use and all the, the online map-based tools that we showcase on our StreamNet website. And Evan Brown from IDFNG is the co-lead uh, for this task. Uh, this one has been a bit slower in getting started up. Uh, we had a, a little bit of setbacks with COVID and destroying headquarter buildings in Idaho and rebuilding <laughs> headquarters in Idaho. Uh, but there has been uh, work ongoing, slightly a slower pace in the background uh, with Van reaching out to some of our other, other partners to get a sense of availability of bull trout existing GIS layers, uh, since that will be the prototype that we'll be using to help define a process that can be used to develop uh, new GIS boundaries for other focal species or species of interest, either resident fish or anatomous fish. Uh, Evan and Van are back 
on it now, uh, 2022. So they're going to be speeding up a little bit more their progress in developing the draft products. And once that draft strawfish product is ready, that's when they'll be convening the uh, task work group so that they can um, start discussing their proposed approach for developing um, new GIS boundaries that can help support StreamNet and Pacific State uh, map-based tools. So stay tuned for that one. And if you haven't already shared your uh, name and are interested in participating in this uh, work group, just send your name to Meg and she'll make sure that you're included when we uh, put together that, the call for the first doodle. Any questions before we move on? All right, I'll pass this one on to the next person. Thanks, Nancy. Um, I'll jump in. Um, I'm going to give an update on the carrying capacity task uh, for trying to come up with a data standard for um, and um, other information associated with the carrying capacity initiative. Sorry. Um, so what's happened so far, just give an update on our progress, which is we held our first meeting on the 29th. Um, we confirmed with the participants on the general scope. Um, what we are still looking for is some additional information and, and interest um, and trying to engage additional biologists in the region. We're trying to follow up with more of the life cycle modeling work group um, staff to uh, see if they're going to be able to engage in the products and process to create um, the the tasks that we are working on. The next step is we have a draft paper um, and we're going to try to set up our next meeting to review a draft paper and concept on proper uses of um, carrying capacity doc, uh, doc, um, data. Um, we're also going to review um, a proposed DES concept um, and, and um, controlled vocabulary for information, which includes, you know, data, you know, what data inputs should be shared um, how do we standardize that information as well as what are the outputs? Um, how do we standardize the outputs for these models and these products? Um, the next meeting is still to be determined where once we've worked on these papers and these products a little bit more, we'll set out a doodle invite uh, for the next meeting. Um, if you are interested, uh, please contact myself, Morgan Bond, Tim Copeland, um, and we'll make sure you're on the meeting invite and we will send it through the general fish monitoring work group for awareness. Uh, the DES categories of information just for some aware and, um, awareness on what we're talking about is that we're looking at standard information and how species information, geospatial information, abundance, and data set metadata are documented in these products uh, such that when they are shared um, you have easy continuity to display or use that information. Next slide. Um, an additional task, so this is a different uh, work group, the juvenile density data standards for snorkel and electrofishing. Um, myself, Casey Bliesner and Marika Dobos um, have been uh, working on trying to create a data exchange standard with controlled vocabulary for uh, distribution data and density data from snorkeling and electrofishing data sets. Um, we have, the goal is to create uh, standard DES for juvenile distribution and density data, uh, documentations on proper uses, and recommendations for data management and sharing uh, systems. Next slide. We are setting up and sent out a doodle. Um, please click on the link. Uh, Meg, if it's possible, if uh, you I think you've already put it in the chat. Um, if we're looking to set our first meeting um, here shortly, and we're going to discuss the data standard and um, through the discussion we think that there's a lot of issues related to um, you know species aging or you know uh, types and, and other things that um, may be sticking points and we want to talk about those um, the data categories and the data exchange standards that we're looking at are site and reach information sample event information species type information abundance and efficiency um, is related to observed counts and estimated abundance, uh, the sample unit sizes, and data set metadata. So 
if there are any questions on this task, uh, we hope to engage people on our first meeting, uh, which will be coming up later. Uh, I think we're shooting for mid-February to, to early March, but ideally mid-February before um, you know, seasons begin. Next slide. Um, in addition, um, myself, Polly Gibson with ODFNW, Casey Bliesner, and Marika Dobos have also worked on a rotary screw trap data collection standard. Um, we've been using the data sets from those two uh, um, organizations, um, as well as some other organizations to try to look at the common data fields collected in rotary screw traps and create a data exchange standard um, for that data. <clears throat> Again, the purpose of this is to, to look at opportunities to standardize the data entry and, and data fields that are used in uh, rotary screw trap operations that may be exchanged for models or tools um, to help do um, you know, further analysis. Um, as I said, the main product here is a data exchange standard for site operations and fish condition data uh, with count and abundance and efficiency. Um, we have an initial test on the data with IDF and G data being submitted in it and ODF and W submitted in this from subsets of their programs. Um, but our goal is to, uh, next slide, our goal is to kick off our first meeting, um, share the information, um, just like the juvenile uh, survey. We have a separate link um, for a separate meeting, um, a separate doodle that will be um, again targeted in February to early March. Um, Again, we're going to the same point is to discuss the standard, look at the sticking points and, you know, looking at these data categories of trap site information, uh, sample event information, individual fish information, uh, efficiency, mark and tag information and the data set metadata. So those are the basic elements of um, three tasks that, you know, I'm helping lead and where we're going with those. Meg and you did, Meg, if you, uh, Meg posted in the chat, these hyperlinks um, and or the not the hyperlinks, but provided the URLs for um, the doodles for these meetings. And I'll stop there. If there's any questions, please feel free to add something to the chat. Um, otherwise, we hope to see you at the first kickoff meetings. Meg, next slide. Thanks, Russ. Yep. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris Hommel. I work with the Northwest Power and Conservation Council. And I'd like to talk about our next task here, which is um, titled Using Existing Cap Fish HLIs to Inform Adult Abundance Estimates for the Groups Identified by MAFEC and Incorporated in the 2020 Addendum. So let me just start with a little bit of background here before I talk about what we're trying to do with this task. Um, the 2020 addendum to the Council's Fish and Wildlife Program included strategy performance indicators, which were all suggested by managers. As we were developing this addendum, um, this occurred concurrently with the NOAA Marine Fisheries Advisory Committee Columbia Basin Partnership Task Force, MAFAC. And that group was developing escapement goals for these newly defined stock groupings. So managers requested that we include these goals in our addendum and also track progress toward meeting them. But because these stock groupings are larger in um, geographic extent than most of the population scale data in StreamNet, we needed to be able to develop a set of rules for how we would sort of summarize or roll up this population scale data into the scale of the MAVAC stocks. We're using this um, fish monitoring work group process to do that. So we've got this new task um, and the goal will be to develop a process, um, a set of rules for how to uh, roll up the data and also modify StreamNet's existing display and query tools so that we can um, display information at this MAFAC scale. So we'll develop a set of draft recommendations. We'll do this um, in conjunction with the collaborative. We want to make sure that whatever approach we're taking is something that matches their expectation as well. And then we'll deliver final recommendations to the StreamNet Executive Committee. 
So uh, right now we're going to have a core group work on a little prep work ahead of time, trying to get a sense of what data we're dealing with and where missing data may exist and just what kind of rules we might need to work on. And uh, we'll be sending out a doodle in March to um, generate new participants in this work group. We're, pr we're pr um, particularly interested in technical experts who would be familiar with either population monitoring in general or the, the CAP data in StreamNet. Um, so if you're interested in participating in this work group, please send either myself or Laura Erickson an email and we'll make sure you get that doodle. And I'd also like to take a second to introduce Laura if you want to turn your camera on real quick. She is going to be the co-lead on this task um, from Pacific States. Is Laura here? Yeah, um, hopefully you can see me and hear me, but um, yeah, I am um, recently rejoined PSMFC uh, last month after a 20 year break. Um, I was working at IPHC, International Pacific Halibut Commission, and I um, took George Nander's position, who um, retired, um, but Nancy and I are working together on kind of divvying up tasks. So. Nice to meet everybody or see everybody or most of you anyway. Thanks, Laura. Well, that's all we have, so please get in touch if this is interesting to you or, you know, if you know somebody else that we should think about including in this group, please let us know. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Chris and Laura. Uh, next slide, Jen. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yep, totally. OK, Hi, uh, I'm Marika Dobo, so I'm just going to uh, give you a little rundown of a uh, summary of basically what you've been hearing on the tasks that are completed, the ones that have been initiated, the ones that are currently active. And we have a few kind of uh, set aside for now some I, some ideas people are interested in being involved with in so those ones have not been initiated yet so if folks want to be involved in any of these please get a hold of the task leaders um, we appreciate any help that folks are willing to provide and there are plans uh, in the upcoming summer to start the uh, couple of other new tasks involving Pythagorean data and analyses. So um, yeah, if you guys have any questions on the given, on the current tasks that we have initiated, please uh, contact us. Fantastic. Thanks, Marika. Mm -hmm. Next slide, Jen. I'm going to hand this over to Casey to introduce Ian. All right, got my camera working again. Um, hi everyone, I'm Casey Bliesner. I work with ODFW and I work with Ian um, on John Day and, and fishery search topics in Northeast Oregon. And I'm very happy to be able to introduce Ian today. Um, I asked Ian for a short bio, so he says, um, Ian is an Oregon native who didn't catch his first steelhead until age 10, not for lack of trying before age 10, though. He received a BS in environmental science from Portland State and thesis, thesis topic is Hood River Winter Steelhead and an MS in fishery science from Oregon State um, with a thesis topic on South Fork John Day summer steelhead. Ian has been working on John Day steelhead and salmon research for the past 19 years, seven with Oregon State University and 12 with ODFW. Um, Ian is, uh, this is this is my add on. <laughs> Ian is a smart and passionate fish biologist currently working as ODFW's John Day fish research project leader, successfully leading a hardworking team of fishy people conducting new and interesting research on salmon and steelhead in the John Day Basin. Um, Ian's been talking about this research that he's going to discuss today for a while, and I'm really excited to hear about it. Um, 
So on to you, Ian. OK, thank you for that intro, Casey, and thanks for um, the invite and chance to present today. So I'm going to start sharing here. OK, is everybody seeing that title slide there? Yep, looks great. Thanks, Ian. OK, awesome. Well, yeah, thank you. My name is Ian Town, for Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. Thanks for the opportunity to present today. And I want to go through, at least at a high level, some of the work we've been doing to describe and quantify the migration patterns of John Day River adult steelhead um, in the Columbia and lower John Day system. I've been working on this uh, the past couple of years with Logan Brashears, who's um, been in a job rotation for ODFW, uh, working as a grad student at OSU. He's really been the lead um, field person on this project, collecting and, and starting into the data analysis on much of it. So for a brief intro and background here, um, tributary overshoot is a concern for several mid-Columbia and lower Snake River steelhead populations. And we define overshoot here as when a fish um, is detected at a hydro project dam further up the Columbia or Snake River than their basin, their natal basin of origin. So fish migrating further up the main stem than necessary to return to their natal origin stream. Um, generally, I think the data suggests that this is most prevalent for John Day origin steelhead among all of these populations. And that's based on uh, many years of, of pit tag detection data that I'll jump into momentarily here. Um, but really the, the impetus for this project is that pit tag detections identify the issue, but don't inform us generally about what fish are actually doing at a specific tributary confluence. So jumping into some of the data um, that sort of framed our concern for this issue here, um, these are the proportions of John Day origin steelhead and Chinook that are overshooting the mouth of the John Day River. So again, um, here's the John Day watershed in gray, outlined in gray here, located in, in central Northeast Oregon. And so the line graph here is the percentage of fish that were tagged in the John Day as juveniles and then returned to Bonneville Dam as adults. And the percentage of those returns to adults, which are subsequently detected at McNary Dam, which is located here, about 120 kilometers upstream of the mouth of the John Day River. Um, and so here's a time series plot of proportion of steelhead returning to Bonneville, which overshoot to McNary, and this top line here in orange, and then proportion of Spring Chinook. Um, from the John Day River returning to Bonneville, which also overshoot to McNary. So two things to bring out here. One is that obviously the proportion is much higher for steelhead. Um, some variability among years, but generally a long-term average in the 55 to 60% range. So the majority of John Day steelhead returning to Bonneville um, ultimately overshoot past McNary Dam. And secondly, um, although it's, there's been much less discussion of it, um, of the overshoot phenomena also applies to John Day Chinook with in some years up to 23% of the John Day Spring Chinook run crossing McNary Dam. Okay, so I want to provide a little bit of um, environmental context for about the John Day Columbia River confluence and environmental patterns there. So this bottom right figure here, this is the John Day River um, flowing northwesterly down into the Columbia River here, just upstream of, of John Day Dam. This bottom left picture is a shot looking upstream at one of the passage routes up over Tumwater Falls on the John Day. Tumwater Falls is located um, right about where this arrow is here. Um, and this, this blue dot right here represents approximately the upstream um, influence of, of impoundment from John Day Dam. So there's a long section of the lower John Day that's impounded by um, the change in elevation from John Day Dam. So jumping into the temperature and flow patterns here, 
Um, this, these are 2020 hourly stream temperatures in the top left graph here. The, uh, the gray lines are the hourly temperatures just a little ways upstream of Tum Waterfalls <clears throat> in the free flowing section of the John Day River. The orange lines are the hourly temperatures at Philippi Park, which is um, this kind of middle section of the impounded reach of the John Day. And then the blue line is um, one of these three water temperature loggers out in the Columbia along the shoreline. Um, generally, temperatures pretty consistent among all three of these loggers in the Columbia. So the key patterns I want to bring out here are the, the gray line, so the, the main stem, the free-flowing section of the John Day temperatures, a little bit toasty in the summertime, right? In July and August, you know, you're seeing daily peaks there up to 30 degrees C in, in 2020. And this is a pretty representative um, year in general. So you get really high temperatures and high diel variability in the, the John Day in the summer. The Columbia during the summer is cooler up until about early September. So right here in early September around Labor Day, the uh, the small um, flow size of the John Day at that point permits it to cool down pretty rapidly. So you see rapid cooling in the John Day. And so that, that John Day inflow water is actually cooler, you know, generally by early September, although there, there can be some diel variability there. Um, cools off pretty quickly in September. And then by October, it's consistently cooler than the than the Columbia and obviously drops a lot more in the winter time than the Columbia. And then secondly, this um, there's an area, there's a mixing zone here, right, around this Philippi Park area where the orange line here, the Philippi Park temperatures are uh, much more attenuated than the John Day River temperatures. So they're not as hot in the summer and then they also cool much more slowly in the fall. So it cools somewhat in September, more in October. And then finally by November to December, the, the Philippi Park temperatures began to uh, mimic the, the John Day River temperatures. So there's potentially a, a complicated um, mixing and maybe a thermal stratification um, effect going on somewhere in this, in this impounded reach. And then shifting over just a little bit to the flow dynamics here. Um, these are the, the flow data, daily daily discharge in cubic feet per second of the John Day River at McDonald Ferry, which is just slightly off this map here. So beginning in July, um, July 1 of 2020, you've got about 1,000 CFS flow. You know, that declines pretty rapidly down to a base flow of around 60 or so CFS in August and September. And then you see a really rapid increase in early October. Um, end of September is when irrigation season ends in John Day. So you see a pretty good jump in the stream flow in early October. And then flow increases somewhat gradually after that. So you get a rapid jump up to about 200 to 300 TFS. And then it gradually increases um, from then on through fall and, and early winter. So after that brief description of the um, environmental setting and characteristics there at the mouth of the John Day, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the, the temporal pattern of steelhead overshoot um, just in the John Day pool. So since about 2017, I think, um, there's been pit detection in the adult ladders at John Day Dam. So what we did in this figure is went through um, two week periods of when we could assign fish to entering or crossing the, the John Day ladders and entering the John Day pool and looked at the, on a two week basis, the proportion of those fish entering John Day pool that were later detected at McNary Dam. And so this is beginning in late June here. We get a couple of fish, make it up early um, to John Day Dam in late, the very end of June, and then proceeds all the way through the end of December with again a very small number of fish crossing John Day Dam um, in the winter time. Numbers here are sample sizes for the last four years there for each of those um, two week blocks. And so I guess the key pattern I want to bring out here is this dome shaped relationship, right? Of um, generally about 60% of the fish arriving in the John Day pool in July and August 
overshoot and go across the McNary Dam. Um, that rises to, you know, in the 80% range around early September and then very gradually declines. Um, but even, even after October 1st, right, into October and November, if you think back to the previous slide where, you know, by October and November, water temperatures in the John Day are much cooler than the Columbia. Flow has increased substantially, yet there's still over 50%, up to 60% or more of the fish arriving in the John Day pool in October and November are still overshooting the mouth of the river and going to McNary Dam. So to me, that's really the, the kernel of, of what we were trying to dig into with this project is why are those October and November fish um, bypassing these environmental conditions that seem very suitable, indeed, probably better than the, in the Columbia River, and then going up into up past McNary. Okay, so just to reiterate a few of these relationships, um, overshoot probability does not appear responsive to temperature. Um, there's lower overshoot to McNary in early summer when the temps are high and then a higher probability of overshoot late in the summer and early fall when the stream temperatures in the John Day are actually lower than they are in the Columbia. And, and overshoot probability does not appear directly proportional to John Day flow. Um, that really big bump in, in discharge in the John Day in October doesn't really create a, a concomitant drop in um, proportion of fish overshooting. And so, you know, we think that maybe the current velocity dynamics of the confluence are attenuating the influence of John Day flow on overshoot. So I guess, you know, where that left us at the beginning of this project is trying to figure out these couple of key questions of do adults enter the river and then exit or just not enter the river at all when they're migrating upstream prior to overshoot? And kind of the corollary there is figuring out where and how these fish travel prior to um, and then during entry and overshoot. So to break it down into objectives here, um, we had three objectives really with this project. First was to um, quantify cold water refuge use um, in the Columbia River in what we're dubbing here as the low smolt transport era. So with a, a lower proportion of fish barge transported out of the um, snake system in recent years, we wanted to see as fish migrate up to Columbia, if they're still using cold water refuges at or near the, the level of early, earlier on work done by U of I. Um, objective two was to identify entry and exit patterns at the John Day River mouth. And then thirdly, um, we wanted to track uh, movement patterns through the John Day pool, including fallback from the McNary Four Bay. So again, I mean, we've got, we've collected, you know, like a million or more um, acoustic receiver pings here um, over the course of the project. So I can't dive into all these things in, in super great detail, but at least wanted to touch on all three of these objectives um, as really we're just beginning these analyses. So I wanted to touch on these objectives to give people a broad sense overview of the data, and then hopefully we can continue some ongoing conversations later after this meeting. Okay, so a little bit of our methods here. Um, we coordinated with um, Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commissioner Critfic and, and used the Bonneville Adult Fish Sampling Facility in 2020. And I mean, really, we, we couldn't have done this project without Critfic's help and assistance there at, at the AFF. So a big thank you to all the folks there that helped us. Um, working with them, we were able to capture and tag 200 wild A index size steelhead at Bonneville in summer of 2020. And so essentially what we did was a for lack of a better term, kind of a, a broadcast approach to um, getting tags into the steelhead that that we suspected, you know, had the highest possible probability of returning to the John Day River and ultimately spawning in the, in the John Day Basin. We used um, Vemco 69 kilohertz acoustic transmitters because that was that allowed us to leverage um, some of the existing receivers both um, receivers that ODFW Sturgeon project had in place and then receivers that we were able to borrow from from Critfic to wire up some of the cold water refuges and other locations. And then we also um, basically followed the, the Critfic protocol there and used 
uh, a pit tag, place the pit tag into the pelvic girdle to also have that as the secondary way of, of tracking fish. So here's a schematic of basically our methods here. Um, this top line is the um, basically a time series of John Day origin pit tag steelhead returning to Bonneville in 2020. The number of fish returning to Bonneville and pit, John Day pit tag fish returning in 2020 was pretty small. Um, it was only in the double digits, which is quite a bit smaller than prior years. So because of that, we only captured one we only recaptured one returning John Day origin fish, which we ended up um, passing because of a, a pinniped injury. So essentially what we did was we tried to track this, this curve here, right, of the peak arrival occurring in late July, early August. We tracked that curve the best we could with um, tag deployment. We were perhaps a little bit late, but in general, our pattern of tag deployment you know, match that John Day return timing fairly well for 2020. Um, and so here's a steelhead that's tagged and being released into the study here. Um, these are the, the Vemco acoustic tags that we placed intragastrically. Um, the smaller one is just a pinger tag. The larger tag is has pings and has um, temp and pressure sensors on it. So we placed that intragastrically and then uh, pit tag into the pelvic girdle as well. Okay, so our acoustic receiver locations. Um, this is a broad scale overview here with a few pop outs. I'm going to start at the left slide, left side of the slide here. Uh, Bonneville Dam is just slightly off the, the left of this figure here. The Columbia is flowing from your right to your left on the, on the figure here. So each of these pink dots downstream of the dowels represents um, one or more acoustic receivers located in cold water refuge areas, um, generally both inside the cold water refuge and potentially in the plume into the Columbia River. So this first pop out here shows the, the John Day confluence, an example of the receivers we had at the John, sorry, at the Deschutes River confluence with one in the Deschutes and then one slightly upstream and one in the, the plume area downstream. The next pop out here shows the John Day River confluence. We had that area pretty well saturated with um, five receivers basically right at the adjacent to the mouth of the John Day in the Columbia and then some other receivers upstream downstream and then several scattered up into the uh, impounded section and the free flowing section of the John Day River. And then moving up the Columbia um, we also deployed uh, receivers upstream of McNary Dam, um, given our expectation that fish would overshoot up there. And then, um, as I mentioned before, ODFW Sturgeon Project also had um, receivers in the John Day Reservoir. So they had receivers at Arlington, uh, Crow Butte, Irrigan, and then a, a pretty dense network of receivers right in the, the tail race of uh, McNary Dam. And those are, were and are deployed for tracking of acoustic tag sturgeon, but uh, by using the BEMCO technology, we were able to um, coordinate on that and, and get detections of those tag steelhead at all of these sites as well. Okay, so jumping into the, the final destinations of where all these 200 um, or so steelhead went, um, this is basically an upstream to downstream sorry, downstream to upstream bar plot of final destinations of, of these tag steelhead. A few things I want to bring out here. Um, this box on the left represents fish which we could not assign as leaving the, the main stem Columbia or Snake River um, hydro project areas. So these are either fish which either died in the, the main stem Columbia um, or exited into a tributary that was not monitored with pit tag antennas or um, entered a tributary that was monitored but missed, missed detection. So um, the two largest bars here are this unknown greater than Bonneville Dam category. So these are fish that likely did not exit the Bonneville Dam pool. The second one is a fish, the, the unknown greater than lower granite dam. So these are fish that we could not assign to 
to a tributary of entry above lower granite dam um, most likely there that you know potentially those fish are entering tributaries and, and missing detection um, so looking at the tributaries here um, we could assign 16 fish to it entering and spawning in the john day river or entering the john day during a probable spawning period um, 16 entering the grand ronde and 14 entering the yakima so we're going to dial down into these these 16 fish entering the John Day and look at their migration patterns um, through the Columbia and John Day. Um, and one other thing I want to bring out here is that, so looking at the data here, 87% of the acoustic tagged fish that we handled in 2020 um, moved out of the Bonneville pool, either up over the Dalles or into the Klickitat. Um, and that's pretty consistent with the long-term Bonneville to the Dalles conversion of 85% for John Day origin fish and 88% for Snake River fish. And those are fish that are tagged as juveniles, returned to Bonneville, detected at Bonneville as adults, and the vast majority of those are unhandled at Bonneville, um, you know, going up through the ladders without going through the adult fish facility. So in general, it suggests that there is very little um, impact on conversion from the, the handling of these fish at, at the AFF. Okay, so jumping into the cold water refuge occupancy. Um, these are cold water refuges stacked from, from downstream at the top to upstream at the bottom. And these are the percents of all available steelhead um, that used these cold water refuges. So in general, um, there's relatively low usage of Herman, Wind River, um, and Klickitat River. A um, little bit higher use of Eagle Creek, although that receiver the only receiver we had there is located actually in the plume, so it's really in the Columbia. Um, so it's kind of a hard one to tease out there whether they're actually using that trip, whether they're using the cold water refuge or actually just kind of swimming by in the Columbia. Um, so that's a sort of an anomaly there. Um, most usage of cold water refuges was Drano Lake, in quotes, the, the Little White Salmon River, and then the Deschutes River, 40 some percent of total available steelhead using both of those. And then um, John Day steelhead, you know, roughly following in in suit there with pretty heavy use of both the Drano and the Deschutes. So to jump into the timing of cold water refuge occupancy, again, these are, these are acoustic receiver locations from downstream at the top to um, upstream at the bottom. Some of these are going on into the John Day. So I wanna focus for the cold water refuge just on these top several here from Eagle down to the Deschutes right here. Um, these, this is a density ridgeline plot showing the timing of occupancy here, not necessarily the relative um, proportion occupying these different um, cold water refuges. The vertical dashed lines are ODFW's fishing closure periods in the Oregon cold water refuges. So fishing closure the last couple of years began on July 15th on the left here and ended on September 15th. So in general, you can see that most of the occupancy of those cold water refuges falls within that, that closure window with the exception, um, I guess, of the, these long tails in the Deschutes here. So some extended occupancy in the Deschutes and we'll get into that a little bit for the John Day fish when we dive into their um, couple of their individual roadmaps. So cold water refuge use conclusions. Um, first thing I want to bring up here is that 2020 represented, um, I kind of hate to use the word benign, but you know, it put it in quotes here, benign conditions in the Columbia system compared to um, drought and high temperature years like 2015 and 2021. So I just want to keep that in mind as we think about the percentages of fish using cold water refuges. Um, despite those benign conditions, there was heavy utilization of both Drano and the Deschutes. Um, and then one thing we identified for John Day fish was that um, some of the John Day steelhead fell back out of the John Day in July and August. So they, they went up into the John Day in July and August, and then they exited the river, went back over John Day Dam, went into the Deschutes in summer, spent a substantial chunk of time in the Deschutes, then exited, exited the Deschutes and went back into the John Day in fall. So that's one thing that's potentially driving the the lower probability of early summer overshoot that I mentioned in one of the intro slides. Okay, so 
jumping into into objectives two and three here um I want to move into the john day pool migration patterns of john day spawning steelhead and want to recognize that there's you know a continuum of migration patterns that these fish are exhibit exhibiting here but um, for simplicity and communication and just to kind of initially wrap our heads around it um, we categorized fish into three categories and i've got really simple schematics of those categories right here so um, we have an enter stay category which was 23 percent of the john day spawning and steelhead arriving in john day pool so this is where fish are basically tooling up the river and then come straight into well, straight in sort of a roundabout way into the, the John Day um, without being detected at any of the acoustic receivers upstream of this point right here in the Columbia. And we defined entry as detection at this first, um, at this receiver right here, which is about a kilometer or a little less than a kilometer upstream of the, uh, the Columbia proper. So that's the enter stay route or category. Second category is enter and exit. And again, 23% in this category where fish come up, enter the river at least to this point right here, and then exit and go on upstream in the Columbia. And then the third category, which the majority of the fish fell into was no river entry overshoot. So 54% are in this category where they just tool right on up the Columbia, some of them on the North shore, some in the middle, um, but they go on up the Columbia without ever being detected at this receiver right here in the lower John Day. So I want to walk through um, some individual maps just to give you a sense of the, the data here. And um, there's a lot of detections here, obviously, at all these points here. Um, these are Julian days um, represented in each of these little pop outs here. But on the, the bottom here, I have just kind of grouped and categorized for simplicity. So this is a fish, um, tag code 53937, um, which we put into the enter stay category. So this one arrives at Drano Lake, um, spends August 12th to September 21st in the Drano um, refuge area, moves on up um, two days later, it enters the Deschutes, spends September 23rd to October 13th in the Deschutes, and then bails out of there on October 13th. October 14th, it enters the John Day, migrates right on up the John Day. And then these purple boxes here are this fish moving back downstream in the spring, um, presumably the, the Kelting migration following spawning. So um, now here's the perfect fish, right? We just need to make more of these that just enter directly in, in October and go straight on up the John Day. Um, and then the, moving on to the next category, the enter and exit. Um, this fish spent over a month in Drano and then moves on up and basically in one day it goes up to the chute spends a month there and then two days later in early october it enters briefly enters the lower john day then exits um, proceeds upstream um, spends a you know quite a few pings a lot of time spent in the mcnary four bay um, it's up there through about march 26th and then it exits and then comes back into the back into the john day to, during a probable spawning run in springtime and then finally, here's a, uh, <clears throat> a no river entry overshoot fish. So this spends a little bit of time in Drano in August, um, spends you know August 27th to September 24th in the Deschutes. And then its first arrival to the, the area at, adjacent to the mouth of the John Day is September 25th, um, does not enter the river, overshoots up to McNary. It's at McNary area on September 27th comes back to the mouth of the John Day on October 11th. Then it goes back upstream to McNary area. Then it comes back down and finally enters the John Day on November 1st and 2nd and proceeds upriver. Um, and then again, migrates back out and is detected going back out in the springtime following spawning. Okay, so since we've just kind of ended up at McNary with some overshooting fish, I wanted to dive into a little bit of McNary four bay occupancy. So we had four receivers um, in the four bay of McNary Dam. These are the locations right here on the bottom. Um, and then this, this ridgeline plot here shows acoustic detection patterns of John Day spawning steelhead. So these are just the fish that ended up 
spawning in the, the John Day River. This shows a variety of sites here, but what I want to zoom into is the, the MCNF1 and MCNF3 here. So those are the, the Oregon and Washington shorelines in the McNary Pool. Um, and again, we still have the, this September 15th reference line right here. So um, fish begin arriving in the forebay in early September, and then there's a peak in late October and early November, and then a really long tail here. So there's, there's presence occupancy of John Day spawning steelhead um, in the McNary Four Bay, basically from early September through um, the following March. So um, long time window of fish being present in that area. And then zooming into, I wanna zoom into um, detection pattern of one fish here, fish 16013 um, in the McNary area. So this fish um, arrives here, detected on this, this receiver 11 right here on September 12th. September 12th there, and then crosses the dam on September 12th. Um, and then it's it's detected on this McNary 4 receiver from September 15th through the 17th. Um, last detection here at this receiver is um, 0741 Pacific time on September 17th. Um, and that, that time is important because um, beginning at 800 hours there on September 17th, there's a uh, 9,000 CFS spill block um, at the um, spill, spill bay 20, I believe here, of uh, um, TSW or temporary spillway weir water going over McNary. Um, so slightly before that, right, we see this fish right here. And then later on on the 17th, um, this fish is observed again at this Sturgeon 11 receiver right there. Um, and then it proceeds downstream slowly downstream to the John Day. And we'll dive into its patterns of the John Day in a bit, but um, it's a little bit about the data we have here for McNary and we need to dig into this more, but um, really trying to track where fish are going in relation to spill patterns here at the dam in the long run. Okay, so um, moving down to the, the John Day mouth here, I want to zoom in and show the, um, we had a, a Vemco positioning system array um, five receivers here in the Columbia at the mouth of the John Day that are communicating to each other. So we were using this to develop finer scale um, positioning maps um, of how fish are approaching and using the, the John Day. And before I dive into that, I just want to give a little bit of background on the historical um, and current situation here. So the bottom center and the bottom right are a couple of historical pictures. Um, these are the, the John Day River mouth pre-dam pre completion. So you can see the, the differences in elevation here, right? Here are the old, here's the old railroad bridge right here. And then here's the new railroad bridge. Um, and then here's an aerial shot of, um, this is right after the 1964 flood that um, washed down version one of the I-84 bridge here. Um, so here's a bunch of the, the bridge wreckage right here. Um, and the one interesting thing um, that we noticed here is that here's a, a, a depth finder shot um, of our boat right here, just west of the current, sorry, just north of the current railroad bridge. Um, looks like at least one, maybe more of these old bridges were retired um, in place. They're still in place there just um, 75 feet under the surface of the water. And then this wreckage here is also still in place. That was never retrieved. So there's a lot of iron down here at the bottom of the river and above it, obviously. Um, and so now we've got a situation where these fish are, um, you know, swimming over and un over, under, through a bunch of uh, metal, a bunch of ferrous material. And, you know, one thing that pops into my head is that, you know, we're still learning a lot about how, um, about magnetoreception in fish. And this is just an image from a recent paper by um, Renee Bellinger in the Banks Lab. Um, there's still a lot to be learned, I think, about magnetoreception. And um, there could be some potential effects here of, of all this stuff in the in the John Day and effects there, which, you know, just something that's always popped into my head. So, um, so these are this is the receiver we had, receiver network we had in the John Day. 
sorry, in the Columbia, and we've also done um, velocity monitoring here, um, basically releasing floating GPS units. And these blue lines here represent the tracks there. So um, in general, the current is migrating, the current is moving down the Columbia and then up the John Day. So the current's actually going upstream here. So our ultimate goal is to relate the um, movement patterns of steelhead here to the, the current velocity patterns and directions um, at this confluence area. So to go into just a couple of um, fish migration patterns here um, by category, this is a fish, um, fish 53910, that was in the enter and stay category. And the fish that were able to directly enter the river appear to migrate more quickly through this area. So this fish was just pinged twice in the array. It was, it was migrating this direction right here. And so only detected twice in this array at these two locations, and then it moves on in and enters the river. And then um, want to move into the, the no river entry overshoot fish. So this is the fish that we walked through its history at McNary. So it's at McNary from September 12th to 17th, and then it makes it back down to the, the John Day um, on October 1st. And so it does a pass going from upstream to downstream here on October 1st. Um, and then it does another upstream to downstream pass later on the 1st. And then it does a loop through, does kind of a circular pattern here again later on October 1st, circles in and then moves out. And then again, still <clears throat> later on October 1st, swims downstream parallel to the mouth again. Um, and then finally on October 2nd and 3rd, it um, October 2nd, it, it does this pattern and then finally it moves into the river on October 2nd and 3rd. So um, that was just a really, you know, I guess high level overview of the data and some of the initial analyses. So to go into some of the future directions of where we want to go here, um, we're planning for active tagging round two this year in 2022. Um, we'll take on a similar approach, um, try to get tag 250 tags into fish. Again, selecting John Day origin pit tag recaptures if possible. Um, and then for cold water refuge monitoring, I think we're likely to increase monitoring of the Deschutes cold water refuge given the delay, the long time period and, and kind of delayed in quotes exit of fish out of the Deschutes. And then finally, um, for John Day and upstream, I think you know, the initial data suggests a need to expand our positioning array at the John Day mouth so we get a, a little wider, a broader scale look at what fish are doing there, um, both in the Columbia and then up into the lower John Day so that we can better um, relate those movements to the environmental variables like um, current velocity, direction, temperature, um, wind patterns in those areas. And then finally, um, we're testing out some some large water pit tag detection arrays in the lower John Day right now. And ultimately, I think our goal is to to try to calibrate the efficiency of those those large water pit arrays with these active tags. So to try to establish those pit arrays as a more um, cost effective vehicle for tracking finer scale, providing finer scale data on movement patterns in the long run. So that's all I had today. So yeah, I just want to thank everybody for listening and thank all those who were involved and contributed and happy to answer any questions if we have time or follow up with folks um, offline later too. So thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, yeah, we, yeah, we absolutely have time. Um, if you guys want to type your questions into the chat or unmute yourselves and ask Ian questions. Um, we did have one question come up in the chat. Let me just from Tom. Uh, Jim might have answered it. Uh, does anyone know what the difference in pre-spawn mortality or spawning success is between overshoot and the inner stay fish? Um, I.e., could there be selection pressure? Yeah, good question. Um, that's one thing we're, we're trying to dive into with this, right, is the, um, the survival rates of those fish that that overshoot and then have to fall back. Um, so we're still working on that. It's going to be challenging to do, I think, with the the broadcast approach. We're really hoping to get, you know, in this next round, get more tags into John Day origin fish 
so that it's easier to track those through their entire um, through that entire run and know that those fish were, you know, in theory, intending to fall back and get back into the John Day. But um, that's one thing where I think we lack the the pit tag detection efficiency right now to answer that via pit tags only. So hopefully, if we can expand our our pit network in the John Day as well with these series of arrays in the lower John Day, then that can also um, improve our ability to answer that question via via pit tags in the future. Excellent, awesome. Uh, Keith, Keith Dublanica just said, uh, great presentation. Uh, what was the sampling year? Yeah, so those were fish tagged in 2020. So they were tagged in July, August of, of 2020. And then we tracked migration basically from July of 2020 through June of 21. So I guess 20, the 20 to that dash 21 run year is the best way to describe it. Awesome. And a question from Russ, uh, for the fish that overshoot and do not return, have you looked at the pit tag data as to where they may be detected and end up in the snake or you see as strays? Um, also, in your decision to tag fish at Bonneville, are you using pit tag release group data from the John Day to help tag more or no John Day fish? Yeah, yeah, thanks, Russ. Um, so for the overshoot and do not return fish, for the active tagged fish, it's difficult to assign, you know, right now because those fish were unknown origin. But we do have some answers to that from the pit tagging data, right? So we know that the majority of the John Day origin pit tagged adults that overshoot stray into the Snake River tributaries, very few stray to the upper Columbia, the majority stay stray into the snake and, you know, really they're distributed through almost all the areas where we have pit tag arrays in the, in the, on the snake, um, both Washington and Oregon shore tributaries. Um, and then the follow up, I guess, yes, we did do. Um, we had sort by code established in at Bonneville in 2020. We're doing sort by code and we caught one fish doing with the sort by code. That's that's where you can um, establish basically a warning signal. Um, so you know that it, as a fish come through the flumes at the AFF, you know that they're of the origin or the group you're looking for. Um, and so we were able to catch at least we caught one, but passed that fish because it was injured. Um, but yeah, there are only about 50 or so total steelhead return pit tag returns in in 2020. Hopefully, there's hoping for more in in 22, so we can get tags in that known origin fish. Cool. Uh, Brian Mashoff had a just a, a comment uh, from his work with BPA. He found that over half of the John Day origin steelhead detected on return in the John Day have previously overshot, which leads to a good question from Andrew Murdoch. Oh, sorry, I lost it. Uh, he asked, do fish that use CWRs have a different probability of overshooting rather than fish that don't use CWR? Yeah, good question. Um, I think we're still diving into that right now on this, um, but it it doesn't appear um, doesn't appear like there's that much difference. And in, in part because the you know such a high percentage of the fish are overshooting, it's going to be tough to tease that one out. Um, but the direct entry fish that we observed in 2020, the majority of those, or I think maybe all of those, did use did use CWR, and so that somewhat delays their arrival at the, the John Day mouth, right? All right, awesome. Ken, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself, and then Marika, I'll read your question. Thanks. Hey, Ian, how's it going? Good, how are you doing, Ken? I'm good, thanks. And I appreciate the presentation and, uh, you know, the, the fish work group hosting you today. I, um, OWEB helps support this work and you submitted a report recently it's so uh, it helps to have the narrative and uh, cause it's, it's a it's such a dense data set and so yeah it's good to hear you present it so thank you for doing this um one of the things that you and I have discussed is um 
how does this work? So what's the solution, right? Um, and is there an opportunity for restoration actions um, to influence environmental conditions to reduce overshoot? You allude to some of the things with dam operations, which OEB can't influence. And so, um, and, and you had some of the data earlier in your presentation showing that overshoot occurs over a range of environmental factors, um, including when you wouldn't think they would overshoot because it's cooler and more flow. And, and so I just didn't know if, since we last talked and some of this analysis has occurred that um, you had any additional thinking on that. Uh, uh, more And again, more watershed restoration and then John Day, I guess, is the, what I'm wondering. Just you're thinking about that at, at this time. And I did hear your stuff about the, um, the bridge wreckage, if you will, uh, underwater that they probably left it there for a reason, right? It's hard to get that out and it's unsafe and challenging. And you see that across the Pacific Northwest from the 64 flood, we still have submerged bridges. Um, so anyways, just some interest in hearing any thoughts you have on that. Yeah, yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, obviously, this is a complex and multifaceted um, issue. And so it has to have a, a multifaceted response in terms of, of management. Um, and so I think we're trying to cover, we're, we are trying to cover all those angles, right? So there's, there's management strategies that could be, you know, that are being employed at McNary. There's potentially strategies that could be employed at John Day. And then in the within watershed as well, I think there's strategies there. And so that's part of why we group these fish into the these three categories right for now. So the the no river entry overshoot strat, you know, group, those fish have to be influenced by strategies in the in the Columbia, right? So those are broader strategies. Um, but where, where we would zoom in on the, on the restoration strategy is on the, on the watershed restoration strategy is for the enter and exit fish. And so, um, you know, we did identify fish that are entering in the summer and then exiting those fish are, they're going up to and past that Philippi area where I showed that sort of mixing zone temperature. So I think a I think one thing we'll dig into for 22 is more finely breaking out how far they go in the, the the impounded section of the John Day, because I think there could be potential for identify for developing um, micro refugia in that section of the the John Day, and so and then if you can provide micro refugia in that July to August period in that section, that could be a strategy for reducing the number of fish that are in that enter and exit and have to go back down over John Day into the Deschutes and then back up. Um, and there's an, I think as part of the Middle Fork IMW work group, there was recently some um, evaluation work about establishing micro, you know, micro CWR in the Columbia downstream of Bonneville, um, some initial thought process, thought processes on that. And so I guess I see if we can further identify where fish are are going to before they make that exit decision in quotes in the summer, then that's where then we begin to bring in some of those potential establishment or you know, development of micro refugia in the the lower John Day as a as a water as a as the watershed specific prong of a of a multi prong strategy to to deal with overshoot. Thank you. Yeah, I, I like and I, briefly. I really appreciate you kind of describing why you bend the fish the way you did and how those require different strategies to reduce overshoot. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Yeah. Great question, Ken. Um, Marika's kind of went along those same lines, at least her second part did. She was kind of asking about the solution to this because they're seeing this behavior in the Umatilla and the Tucannon, but she asked, do you think overshooting movements are natural behavior? <laughs> yeah. She said, yes, probably <laughs> exacerbated by temperature currents and other factors, you know, but what's the solution? 
Yeah, yeah, great, great question, Marika. <laughs> I mean, I wish I had a solid answer for you there, right? And I wish we could time travel back to the the sixties and and have the technology we do now and and monitor the John Day in the sixties. Um, I don't know, you know, my my hunch is that it's it, my hypothesis, I guess, is that it, it's not, you know, a completely natural behavior because, you know, if this was a, you know, if you think of it as a as a risk averse strategy, right, a fish trying to spread the risk, then why don't we see, you know, from the tagging data with the shoots origin fish, why don't we see the shoots origin fish, you know, migrating over John Day Dam and over McNary to spread the risk and spread out through space, right? I mean, we really don't see that they most of those fish directly enter um so yeah i don't you know it just we don't have a, a great control we have historical anecdotes you know that suggest that fish were more likely to enter the Deschutes or sorry the john day in october you know if you go back before um dam construction but um yeah you know always never know how much emphasis to place on all those historical anecdotes so I guess that's a roundabout way of saying, you know, I don't have a clear answer for your question. I wish I did, but um, given the environment we're in right now, I think I think it's w worthy of investigating overshoot to see if, you know, see what avenues we have, you know, what kind of stra different strategies we have to ameliorate it and, um, you know, try to make fish more successful at direct entry or entering and staying. Yeah, thanks, Ian. It just, the Deschutes, it makes sense because it's it's colder, right? So that is a, a refuge area. But when you're looking, you know, further east into some of these systems that are pretty warm, you know, right now it's advantageous for these fish to seek refuge in the main stem river. Um, I mean, that's just kind of my thoughts. You know, it has the John Day and, you, you know, Umatilla, you know, prior to anthropogenic effects have always been warm. Therefore, the behavior of these fish, they're going to avoid those waters and kind of rear somewhere else until conditions are better. Yeah, yeah, agreed. I mean, there, you know, yeah, we don't have a clear answer on that. And, you know, I think there's probably a lot of, you know, through time, there's been a lot of temporal variability over the course of the season, right? With those, you know, even historically June and July, returning fish may not have been able to enter so yeah they have to go somewhere else but then again i guess just to reiterate that what i was trying to get out with one of those early slides is why are why are the september and october arrivals displaying that same pattern right when when temperatures are you know lower in the john day at that point than they are in the columbia you know what that doesn't seem like an adaptive effect to me to spend more time in in warm water in September and October versus, you know, entering entering air, an area that's already cooler at that point. Excellent. Uh, we have a question from Philip. Uh, do you have any evidence of juvenile steelhead entering the John Day for rearing that were spawned in a different system? Uh, some pit evidence of that type of exchange exists between white salmon and hood rivers. If that's happening, those fish might be identified as overshoots when actually they are just trying to get home. Yeah, good question, Phil. Um, no, we don't have any, so I guess if I'm understanding it, we don't have any evidence of fish from other portions of the Columbia Basin entering, um, juveniles from other portions of the Columbia Basin entering the John Day to rear either as par or during their smolt migration. Um, in part, that could be driven by that right now our, you know, our lowest point of detection in the past has been at McDonald Ferry, which is kilometer 32 on the John Day and fish would have to swim up over Tumwater Falls, which is, you know, depending on the flow, that's a pretty burly obstacle. Um, so they'd have to swim up over that before they could be detected had they been pit tagged somewhere else. Um, the only the places where we are pit tagging juveniles are pretty far upstream. So there are several hundred kilometers upstream for the most part. So it seems unlikely that par from other parts of the Columbia would migrate, you know, 300 kilometers up the John Day to 
to an area where we where we would then be able to catch them in our screw traps and and tag them as John Day origin fish. All right, excellent. Bill said thanks. Um, anybody else have any comments? Feel free to unmute yourself. Feel free to type something in the chat. These have been great questions, guys. All right, cool. I think you wore them out, Ian. <laughs> All right, mission accomplished. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, hey, Russ. Two quick questions, I guess. Um, within your study um, for unknown origin fish, if you're tagging a bunch, and uh, do you also do pair genetics as well to potentially look at genetics for where their origin is? Um, the other question I had is I was just looking at the maps of all the rivers and the inputs and where they go in the dams uh, relative to the reservoirs. John Day is right next to the, the dam above, whereas most of the you know, Umatilla is right below. Uh, Deschutes is below. You know, where, where you look at these rivers, where we look at things, do you think that plays a factor as well, you know, with potential mixing or, or loss of um, you know, a dilution of the John Day for whatever uh, their their ability to hone in and find that being so close and if the fish are going up the left side of the dam or the right side of the dam does your receivers detect um, any difference between the fish that are coming up the right side of the river uh, south side or north side on which proportions go and exceed just kind of curious yeah, yeah, good questions. Uh, so I guess to start with your first one there, um, yeah, we did. So because we were coordinated with Critfic there, they took um, genetic samples from all those. So they've done SNP, um, single nucleotide polymorphism um, panel analyses for all those. Um, we're still working with them on that. It's probably likely that they're going to have to report it out at a pretty big group, right? That I think they've called it the Jolly Green Giant, that that mid Columbia <laughs> and you know, the mid Columbia up to up through, you know, Grand Ron reporting group. So um, but yeah, most of the the John Day, the fish that ended up spawning in John Day are assigning to that big group right now, whether we can, you know, whether they'll be able to zoom in to a finer scale, you know, a population specific with confidence. I think, yeah, I think we're a little un probably unlikely to be able to achieve that right now, given the apparent mixing in there. Um, OK, so then to dive into your second question. Yeah, you know, I, I think a reasonable hypothesis is that there there is probably some effect of, you know, tributary mouth location relative to um, relative to where the hydro projects are, you know, because Umatilla overshoot I mean, right, it's a couple of long casts away from McNary Dam, but the overshoot from probability of overshoot for those fish over McNary is only half of roughly half of what it is for John Day fish, um, even though there's similar temperature and flow going on in the Umatilla in the summertime. So, yeah, I think there probably is some effect there how to quantify that. Um, you know, something we're still thinking about. Um, in terms of the side of the river, we the data, you know, what the avenues that we've analyzed it thus far, it doesn't seem to matter too much what side of the river they're on at John Day Dam. There, you know, some fish are able to are coming up the north ladder and are able to cross and directly enter, and some fish are migrating up the south ladder at John Day and still overshoot. Um, so that you know, side of the river, the dam doesn't seem to be a um, a major effect thus far, but we're going to keep, you know, looking into that with the um, receiver network there. Yeah, and I mean, the data also shows the fish that are clearly entering and making the choice to leave and um, go upstream anyway. So there's other factors or something's going on. So, so thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, and Philip had another question. Are you planning on running genetics on the adults you tag in 2020? Yes, so that was what I was alluding to um, with Russell's question there. Yes, we did, um, and I think we're still in the process of, of thinking through some of that. But um, the uh, you know, as I refer to that jolly green giant, right? The 
there's quite a bit of overlap right now, or, or maybe a better way of saying it is difficulty in set distinguishing among populations or what we think are populations of steelhead in the in the mid sea and lower snake region. And again, I guess to circle back to Marika's question, you know, is that a about whether that's a natural phenomena or not? You know, we we don't have the the pre you know really pre data there, but um, we do know that there was a you know for several decades there were you know a large amount of strays going into the John Day um, that were Snake River origin because of transportation. So I think a reasonable hypothesis is that you know that that transport effect signature is still there in the in the genetic um, component side of things. So um, it might take a while for that to sort out. So. Right, and Brian Mashoff asks, uh, from pit tag analysis I did for an EPA report, there is evidence of collective behavior of steelhead in exiting cold water refuges below the dowels. Might John Day steelhead be following other steelhead? Yeah, great point there, Brian. Um, I guess, you know, along with um, magnetoreception, um, that concept or idea of collective navigation that you know that Quinn et al have have brought up or that hypothesis about it I think is another um really important thing and yeah I don't know I mean I would love to <laughs> you know I'd love to answer your your question there but um I think we're still a ways away from being able to answer that that I guess I would flip that around and say you know another part of why I think it's important to dive into overshoot and do as much as we can to uh, ameliorate overshoot, you know, even if fish are successful at getting back downstream is to circle back around to the genetics component here is, you know, maybe there are, when fish are transported, you know, they're clearly having trouble finding the Snake River confluence or, uh, or deciding that's the right, you know, deciding in quotes, that's the right place to go. Um, the majority of Snake River strays. Again, 99% of the strays coming into the John Day were Snake River origin. Those are all transported, were transported as smolts. The majority of those are fallback strays, meaning they go over McNary or they went over McNary and then fall back over McNary and enter the John Day later. So I guess I would flip that question around is maybe, maybe those fallback strays in the past were, you know, glomming on to John Day overshoots and then following them back downstream over McNary into the, into the John Day. So yeah, I think, you know, the data suggests there could be something like that going on. And so I think that's part of the reason why it's important to, you know, figure out what's going on here and what we can do about it. Awesome. All right, we got about five minutes left, guys. Um, so I'm going to wrap this up with Ian. Thanks so much for a fantastic presentation. There was a lot of interest in this topic. Um, yeah, it's definitely talk. interesting. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see steelhead use of cold water refuges and the movements kind of based on that. Like Ken, I also thought the bridge water in the river system potentially affecting uh, magnetoreception is really interesting. Um, and as Jen gets that queued up, we'll go yeah, on to... Thank you for the opportunity. So. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean... Everyone feel free to contact Ian if you want to follow up or have uh, additional questions offline. And we'll give you guys his uh, information in the follow-up email. Uh, let's see. So just a few reminders about where to access information. Um, I'll add it in the chat. Just visit our project page at pdamp.org. Um, also, here's a link to the October meeting in case you guys want to go back and look at that. Um, there's a link to... Neela Kendall and Thomas Buren's presentation. That in the chat. And uh, this kind of leads me to our engagement process real quick. It is likely you're already on the mailing list, but if you have interest in accessing documents or other information via the Teams platform, then you can go sign up two different ways, DOI account or non-DOI. If your organization doesn't allow you access to Teams and you're interested in getting more information, Feel free to contact me and I can direct you to the appropriate task leads for help. Uh, remember, you can sign up for the mailing list or for the team's environment by going to the project uh, page with the link I just dropped. 
to close out for today, I would like to give a big thank you to Ian Tatum uh, for presenting. Fantastic job. Uh, our fish and monitoring work group core team, which is Casey Bliesner, Marie Cadobos, Nancy Leonard, and Russell Scranton. And, uh, and our task leaders and you guys for joining us today and participating. We really appreciate all the time out of you guys taking time out of your busy schedules to help coordinate these activities and develop products to help managers and biologists throughout the region. So thanks again and have a great afternoon.